we go to the church, we put a mask, smile, happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath. But inside, when you go home, we struggle. You must love God more than anything and love your neighbor just as you. If you don't do that, you really don't understand church. When have you been baptized? 27 years ago. But I struggle, pastor. None of us deserve to serve God. None of us. God doesn't need me, doesn't need you. We need God. God can use a donkey so he can use anybody. And we got to realize if God called us, as the spirit of prophecy says, <clears throat> it is that by serving, we grow more like Jesus. And so God called us to serve. Jesus came to serve. and He called you and me to serve. Don't expect to be served. You better serve if you are a Christian, if you are a follower of Jesus. So I want to thank the conference for inviting me. I tell you, it is a challenge to be away from home. I prefer to be with my wife and my garden. <laughs> but it's a privilege when you know that people's lives are touched. And God is using somebody to do that. Praise the Lord. Now, as we start, would you bow my, uh, your heads together with me so we have another short word of prayer? Father, in humbleness, we pray that your spirit may open the word and touch our hearts. In Jesus' precious name, amen. It's wonderful to go to church. Praise the Lord. It is absolutely wonderful to be baptized. Am I right? If you have not been baptized, you better do it. There is great blessing in it. When you are baptized, your sins are forgiven. How many of them? All of them. You are buried dead to the old life, born again to a new life. You have a new start, white, clean. Jesus takes all your sin, puts upon himself and gives you his own perfect, divine, godly robe of righteousness. You are as righteous as God. Isn't that beautiful? And you are adopted as a son or a daughter of God. Isn't that amazing? Well, 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 as good as it sounds, people think that this is it. Hey, I got baptized. Praise the Lord. Let's have a potluck. And that's it. When you have a baby, how many people have children here? Okay. You know the story. When the baby is born, is that the end of the story or the beginning of the story? Hello is the very beginning. Trust me, the baby needs the diaper changed. The baby needs to be fed. You know what I'm talking about? A few days ago, my wife says, honey, it's your turn to change the diaper to the granddaughter. I said, why me? She says, because I do it all the time and you just play with her. I said, but it's not pleasant. It's brown. She says, that's the reason because you love her. Go ahead and do it. We forget about that part in our Christian experience. Oh, the baby was baptized, born again. Praise the Lord. And that's the end of the story. No wonder we have 50-year-old babies that still wear diapers. And that's the reason we have problems in the... When have you been baptized? 27 years ago. But I struggle, pastor. Because they think that the end of the story is at baptism. But when you are in Jesus, after you are born again, you are supposed to grow because if Jesus lives in you, there is growth. Cannot be Jesus in you and you don't grow. If you don't grow, you are sick. Go to the doctor. Am I right? Spiritual. Okay. So there should be growth. We should de develop from the babies to the statue of fullness of Christ. We should develop from milk to heavy food. Am I right? The Bible says that. Christ's presence brings transformation. If there is no transformation, it means it's a dead body. It stinks. And so how does growth happen? Because we talk a lot about grace and it's wonderful, you should. We talk a lot about, uh, about love. Jesus loves me, you know. But we don't talk a lot about growth. What if people judge me that I am judgmental? I would rather talk about grace. It sounds good. But the Bible gives you both in the picture. You follow me? In God, love and justice kiss each other, hug each other, go together. God is love, but God is just. You follow me? In the same time. And if you want to be like God, why don't we talk about the other part? 
And so let me ask you, how does growth happen? Because it's easy to go to church, happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath, how are you? Good, you're good, wonderful, praise the Lord. I got to the church, I said, happy Sabbath, brother. It was in the parking years ago. He says, happy Sabbath, pastor. I said, how are you doing? He says, wonderful. He said, your family, good. Your children, good. Your wife, good. Job, good. Praise the Lord. Oh, man, this, this guy is in heaven. After the sermon, he comes to me, Pastor, can I talk to you? Yes. Let's go to my office. He says, my wife left me. I said, you just told me that you are doing good. He said, ah, oh, we don't mean it. That's how we say it. You follow me? We go to the church, we put a mask, smile, happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath. But inside, when you go home, we struggle. Let me give you an example. I had my, long ago, long ago, 300 years ago. I had my church in Wisconsin. I had my church in Wisconsin. I had three churches. By God's grace, we planted another church. And then a, a Romanian church from Chicago, two hours away, calls me. Our pastor moved. We have no pastor. And we are preparing evangelism. We need help. Would you come and help us with some training? I said, no. <laughs> I would love to. But I preach in my church. And then I run to the church plant because I have evangelists there. And I cannot drive two hours to Chicago, two hours back, because I missed evangelism. Please, pastor, please help us, please. And my wife looks at me, let's help them. Okay. I, I speak in my church. I finished around, uh, you know, 4 p.m. now. <laughs> around 12.30. And then I get in the car instead of eating. And for me, food and Sabbath are holy. You, I never break them, you know. And so I don't eat hungry. I get in the car, speed to Chicago, two hours. I get to their church around 2.30, 3 o'clock. I start preaching. I preach until 4. I do training until 4.30. Talk to them. Give them some instruction. I tell them I'm going to come for two months until you start evangelism every Sabbath. Train you and then leave you alone. And then I get in the car, speed to get 7 p.m. before 7 because at 7 I start evangelism in the church plant and it's farther than my church. It's two hours and a half away. And as I speed, I get between Illinois and Wisconsin and there is a toll. You know, you know toll? But in all times, when you don't have in the windshield an eye pass and you just drive through and it takes your money. All times when there was a funnel and you throw cash, you remember? Well, if you remember, you must be old. Okay. And uh, so, so if you are like me, when I get there, there, there were five tolls. And I look, I count five cars, five cars, three, two. Hey, that's where I go. You know what I mean? You go in the shortest line. And if there are two and two, you look, there is a van, there is a Buick. There is a Mercedes and a BMW. I'm going to get behind this because they go faster. And then when I get in that line, I watch the other line and keep track. If I was there behind the red car, now I would have passed. Why didn't I get there, you know? If you do that, you are sick just like me. <laughs> Don't do that when you pray. Don't do that when you study. Because hurry is the greatest enemy of spiritual life. You cannot be with Jesus in hurry. You follow me? And so I get in the line. Be, be, only two cars. One leaves. Praise the Lord. The other one moves. I move. And, and I hope she moves. And she doesn't keep moving. And she doesn't pay. And she waits and she waits. An eternity, like when you go to the dentist and it never ends, you know. And, and, and you wait and you wait and you wait and you wait and you wait. And I said, what's wrong with her? Is she fabrica fabricating? Is she making? Does she have a money machine? Is she making the money now? Why doesn't she pay? Why doesn't she move? And my wife says, calm down. I am calm. <laughs> <laughs> and the lady finally after two eternities opens the window throws the money and she doesn't throw the money in the funnel and money are all over the street and she cannot open the door because you know some drivers poor drivers she parked too close to the funnel and so she wants to back up and she blows the horn oh by now I get pain in my stomach my ears turn red I start boiling I blow the horn so the guy behind me moves and the guy behind him moves I back up she backs up she opens the door she picks up the money and then she goes to the funnel puts the money in the funnel and instead of going to the car she goes to the booth and starts talking to the lady from the iPass lady I have no time for you to talk move 
And she talks. So I blow the beep, beep. I blow the horn. And she looks back and she waves. Oh. At that moment, I forgot that I am a pastor. And my wife says, calm down. What if she comes to evangelism? I said, she's not coming. <laughs> Finally, she leaves. I get to the toll. I want to throw the money. And the lady from the booth says, no, 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 no need to pay. I said, what? Is it free? She says, come here. I don't have time, lady. Come here. I go. She says, the lady before you paid for you. I said, what? And she says, she was crying. Her hands were shaking. And she said, my son had a car accident. And they call me, he's in the ER, he may not make it. And she says, I, I cannot even hold my hands. And she says, that man behind me is so patient. <laughs> and she said, I'm going to pay for him because he's so kind. <laughs> Can you imagine how I felt? That's what we do. We are wonderful in the church. You understand what I am saying? So how does real growth in nature, in the heart, from inside out, not from outside, hello, hello, oh, I love you, brother. Uh -uh. From inside, real growth, how does it happen in real life? Not only on Sabbath. We should be Adventists of seven days, not of the seventh day. You follow me? How does it happen? How does it happen? So let me give you another story and then we start the ceremony if we have time. My grandfather, my grandfather, when he was 103, he died. He lived 103 years. He lived three centuries. He was born in 1898. 19th century. Lived two years from the 19th century. And then 100 years from the 20th century and died in 2001, so he lived one year from the 21st century. So he caught three centuries. He died when he was 103, a man of prayer. All his life, every day, literally, always, 24-7, singing. He would work, he was a carpenter. He would work and he was always singing Some, or, or whistling. Always songs about Jesus. I said, Grandpa, why do you sing all the time? I said, son, because God is with me. I said, Grandpa, God is with me too and I don't sing. Son, if God was with you, you would sing. <laughs> and then he said to me, that's the reason you struggle, son. Because you have a theory of religion, but not the presence and he would say to me, if God is with you, nobody can be against you. Because God, God is with you. Who can touch you unless he allows it? If he allows it, then you need it. I remember he told us a story many times. The whole church knew the story. In fact, the city, not all the city, but more, many people from the city knew the story. Many years ago, when he was young, it was in that time against the law for three religious people to get together in a public place. If you met somebody from the church in the marketplace, and if a third one came, they would arrest all three because they were afraid that you would preach the gospel. And so could not be three church people together in a, park, in, in a public place without being arrested. And for some reason, they got together. He went from place to place, from village to village, from, from city, from town to town. And he would give Bible studies, though it was against the law. He was caught many times. He was beaten by the police many times. One time they beat him with the boots in his stomach and in his mouth until they broke internal organs. It was a bath of blood in the street and they left him for dead. He was not breathing. And somebody found him, took him to hospital. He was in coma for a few months. He came back and he said, well, God gave me more life. I'm going to keep giving Bibles. And this man, 
was singing, giving Bible studies, doing evangelism, planting churches from village to village, from town to town. And he was in a place with a new church plant that he planted, and the police came at the doors. And there was the law that you could not gather more than three people. So the police formed, 40 police officers formed a tunnel, two lines, 20 and 20, at the door. So when our people would come out of the building, they would go between the two lines, and the police officers had rubber batons, or however you call them, and hit them in the head, and hit them with the shoes, until people would die beaten. And then there would be whoever is alive would be arrested and beaten, and so on and so forth. You folks, we don't know what freedom means. We sometimes give up freedom for comfort. And we don't know what we give up. And back to the story. The police officers, 40 of them, were like a tunnel in front of the exit door. And when people finished, they noticed the police officers. And, and, and they said, we cannot go. We cannot, we, we cannot go out. We are going to be killed. And my grandpa said, if God is real, not a theory, but real. And if he is powerful, and if he is with us, because he says whenever two or three, and if he doesn't lie, why are you afraid? If you are afraid, you either don't have a God, or you have a different God. Because if you have my God, you should scream and sing and jump up and down and just be happy. You know the song? Don't worry. Yeah, be happy. And my grandfather said, hey, in Revelation 17 is a list of people who don't go to heaven. Top of the list, people who are afraid. That means the church is a form, is not a reality. And so my grandfather said, listen, God is with us. He fights for us. He promised, I will go before you. God said, all, all authority, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go, and if you go, I promise I will be with you. And my grandfather said, my God doesn't lie. And if you ask me to be beaten, like Paul the apostle, I'm glad to take a beating for his name. Because he died for me, and I love him enough to take a beating for him, and I consider it a privilege. And then he said, there is no sacrifice too great for the one that you love. And he said, if you are not willing to sacrifice, it means that you love yourself more than you love him. So you worship yourself. Whoa, did you hear it or you want me to repeat it? You want me to say it in Romanian, you would understand better? If you shy away from sacrificing for the Lord, it means that you love yourself or something else, whatever you don't sacrifice, more than you love God. Oh. Because if you really love God, no sacrifice is too great, and you don't only sacrifice for him. You do it joyfully and consider it a privilege. He died for me, I'm willing to die for him, because I don't live for this life. And my grandfather said, let's get out. No, they are going to beat us and kill us. And my grandfather started to sing a song in Romanian that says, I am a son of the king of the king of the king. I am a son of the king and I sing. I am afraid of nothing, 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 because he's with me, with me, with me. Is sunt copil de împărat, de împărat, de împărat, sunt copil de împărat și eu când pe cale, nu mi-e frică de nimic. I am a son of the king, of the king, of, and I sing, I'm afraid of nothing, of nothing, nothing, because God is with me. And he was singing, he opened the door, he got out, and the police officer stepped back. He walked out and he says, chicken, come out! <laughs> Monday morning. The chief of police called my grandfather to the police station. Mr. Goya, I want you to be honest. Who are the soldiers around you? And he says, you drink too much, brother. <laughs> there was nobody. And they said, 40 police officers told me that there were soldiers like the president's guards 
around you. So you better tell us, who do you know at the capital in Bucharest that sent the guards to protect you? And my grandfather, I knew the story from my father, from my mom, the whole church knew the story. And my grandfather said to me when he told me the story, son, if God is with you, who can be against you? And if he allows it, it means you need it. And if you need it, stop praying that he removes it. Rather, stop praying that you grow. Because how in the world are you going to grow if you go through no trials? You just want to go to heaven in a very, very comfortable way. Lord, give me patience. And God says, okay, I'm going to send somebody to bother you so you learn patience. Oh, no, please don't send anybody to bother me. Just give me patience. It doesn't go that way. Give me faith. Okay, I'm going to allow some trials so you learn to trust me. No, 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 no trials, Lord. Just give me, just pour some faith into my brain if you can. And so, the battle belongs to the Lord. If God is with you, if your religion is not a theory but real, then you need to have peace. So I asked my grandfather, how do you get there that God is with you? And my grandfather said, son, and my father told me that one time later, son, do you remember the magnifying glass that your grandma uses to read the Bible? She didn't have glasses. She had a magnifying glass. You know what I'm talking about? I said, yes. Do you remember when you were a kid? Yes. You used to steal it? Yes. You remember what you did? You would run out, put papers? Yes. And you would put it in the sun and focus? Yes. What happened to the papers? They got on fire. And he looked to me and he took me by my cheeks, put his eyes into my eyes and says, whatever you focus on, that's what you get on fire for. So this is the problem that you have, son. You go to church, but you don't focus on Jesus. Your focus is on your motorcycles. That's what I was at that time. It was all about motorcycles, day and night. Pictures with motorcycles, talking about buying another motorcycle. You know, I hope Jesus is going to let me take my motorcycle to heaven. Yeah, my motorcycle never sinned. Why not? <laughs> so, going back, he said, if you focus on politics, you get on fire for politics. If you focus on business, you get on fire. If you focus on your girlfriend, you get on fire. If you focus on sports, you get on fire for that. But if you focus on Jesus, you get on fire for Jesus. And the reason you go to church but you are not on fire is because you focus on something else. Because whatever is your treasure, that's where your heart will be. And son, if you stress about this, or you pray about that, or about that, or about that, whatever you stress of, whatever you pray for, whatever you think of, that's your God. I said, if you really want to experience what I experience, if you want to experience what Moses or Abraham or Daniel or Joseph or what you need to do, son, you really need to focus on Jesus. Because the closer you are to him, his presence does in you what you cannot do in yourself. Folks, that was the introduction. Let's do the sermon. And so, he said to me, son, you need God's presence. You don't need a theory of God. You need the presence of God. And you need to seek that, to thirst for that, to hunger for that. You need to desire God. You need to, don't go to prayer to ask a blessing. Go to prayer to ask for the blesser. There is nothing wrong to ask a blessing, but what God intended to be blessings have become curses because we got to the point that we worship the blessings instead of worshiping the blesser. We seek help instead of seeking him. You got to seek him first and after that. You follow me? You can ask for other things. And so, let me, let me how does growth happen? How do you get to that point? How practically, step by step, you do that? Well, let me give you an example from the Bible. An example that applies to all areas. Your daily life, your family, your spiritual life, your church life, everything. In everything that Satan attacks you. In every area, spiritual, emotional, family, whatever, work, whatever. In every area, this applies. 
I'm going to choose an example. I'm going to choose an example. Joshua. Joshua. Okay, you know Joshua. How many of you know Joshua? You met him? Huh? Okay. And so, Joshua from the Bible. Moses died, and Joshua was called to be the next leader. To walk in Moses' shoes was not an easy job, you know? That's big shoes to walk in. And Joshua knew what we don't realize, that whatever he does <coughs> affects the whole Israel, the whole nation. Basically, he could save that nation or lose that nation. He was responsible for the nation. If he didn't remember a good king, whole Israel would go up. Bad kings, the whole Israel would go down. You remember? You are responsible for the people around you, for your families, for your neighbors. God didn't put you in that neighborhood so you have a house. God put you in that neighborhood so you save the neighbors because God cares for your neighbor. He died for your neighbor. And he says, you are the light. And if you are not the light, you don't go to heaven. He says, you are the salt. And if you are not the salt, you are not good. It's not enough to go to church. You must care for the neighbor. You must love God more than anything and love your neighbor just as you. If you don't do that, you really don't understand church. Church is not about going to the church, singing Kumbaya and going home. Church is about mission. Hello? Jesus didn't come so you can be comfortable. He came so you serve. You follow me? So you save people around you. And so the neighbor, the neighbor, the neighbor, think about that. Joshua was responsible for the neighbor. And Joshua realized God is going to make me responsible for their lives. God is going to make me responsible. Where is the children? Where is the family? Where are the neighbors? They will come to you and say, you knew it and you didn't tell me. We are, his, we are the watchmen. We need to give a clear sound of trumpet. You follow me? And so Joshua knew that. But Joshua realized that in human power, you cannot do it. You cannot get victory. You cannot grow yourself. You cannot change yourself. You cannot save your children. You cannot save your spouse. You cannot change your church. You cannot save the neighbor. It's not by human power. The sooner we understand that, the better. Not only theoretical, but practical. And so Joshua went to prayer. Lord, I need your help. And the Bible says that, that God, that God, let's, let's go to the slide, slide number three. We start there. I don't know if you see it. Slide number three. No, 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 no. You went to slide five. Okay, right here. With great anxiety, humility, and self-distrust, he became the next leader. And he said, Lord, I need your help. And God said, don't worry. Be courageous because I will, I, God, will go with you. What a privilege. God says, I will go with you. God with you. And then, listen carefully. God told Joshua, cross Jordan. Folks, when God talks to you, it's always nonsense. How do I know, pastor, if it's God's voice or my voice? Well, I tell you how. If it makes sense, it's your brain. If it's crazy, then it's God. Because whatever God says is so big that it seems to be crazy for our mind. Because God's wisdom is foolishness for the Jews and for the Greeks and for the Romans. You understand? When God told Noah, build an ark, wasn't that crazy? Uh-huh. When God told Joshua, walk around Jericho. Wasn't that crazy? When God told Gideon, don't take a weapon, go to war with a trumpet and a light. Hello? When God told Jehoshaphat, put the choir in front of the army. Would you want to sing in that choir? When God talks, doesn't make any sense. So you don't need. There are people who never obey before it makes sense to their brain. Hello, your brain is too small to understand God. The song says, understand and obey, or trust and obey. There is no... You don't need to understand God in order to obey God. You need to know God in order to obey God. And so Joshua knew God. When God says, cross Jericho, Joshua didn't say, let's have a board meeting. <laughs> you understand? So what, what, what did God ask him to do? Let's see. This is Jordan. Have you been there? How many people? I've been there. 
You know what I'm talking about. It was up to here, and it was about seven feet from here to here. Pam, 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 pam. I crossed Jordan so small that you cannot find the place to be baptized. You need to go down, 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 and finally you find the place that the water is up to here, and you get. That's easy to cross Jordan. However, the Bible and the history says that when God asked him to cross Jordan, it was in the rainy season. Rainy season twice a year, April and October, when Jordan, when the snow melts in the mountains and the rain comes and the water comes and takes trees and takes trunks and it comes and it is literally 1,600 meters wide. That's one mile wide. And it's fast and it's deep. And listen, not only that, but they had babies, they had elderly. You remember? How would you cross Jordan? They didn't have boats. <laughs> How do you do it? When God asks you to do something, it is always, not only that it doesn't make sense, but it is always, from the human perspective, impossible. Because our God is so big that he cannot ask you something small. <laughs> Therefore, you need to have a relationship with God in order to obey when he talks. Therefore, he doesn't talk to you and to me. Because whatever he talks, we don't even hear it. We say, oh, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> And we dismiss it altogether. Therefore, you need to be a man or a woman of prayer to know your God when he talks, you know his voice, you know how he works, and you don't understand, but you trust in him. Like Abraham, sacrifice your son. Done. You understand? And so, cross Jordan. God didn't tell him how. God just told him to do it. Because when God asks you to do something, he will provide the means. When you have a meeting and you make a plan, then you need to ask God, would you bless my plan? And then nothing happens. But if you have a meeting and you say, God, give me your plan, then God gives you also his resources and his power and his blessing, and you don't need to struggle. And so, Joshua knew that whatever God commands, if God commands, if God tells you to do it, then he will provide a way. So Joshua obeyed in faith. The Bible says that nothing happened, no miracle, until the priests stepped into the, into the water. God is never early. Am I right? That's the reason the Bible says those who wait upon the Lord. God is always in the last mo second, in the last moment, in the last moment. He's never late either. But he's never early, you know. And so, you don't wait until problems are removed to obey God's plan. You step out in faith, step out in trouble, trusting in him. Trusting. I remember when my youngest son was three years old, I came home with a motorcycle every day, and he would come, Daddy, will you give me a ride, please? I would put him in the back and go just a little around, you know, in front of the building, and then put him down, and he would say, it's like heaven. <laughs> Next day, Daddy, would you give me a ride? <laughs> oh, Daddy, it feels like heaven. One day he comes to me and says, Daddy, can you buy me a bike so I could be in heaven too? I said, son, you are too small. Daddy, I need a bike. I said, you cannot have a bike. You need to grow up. Daddy, I need a bike like yours. I could buy you a little Hot Wheels, $1 bike. He said, no, 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 no. Don't fool me. I need to be able to ride on it. Son, you are too small. This bike is heavy. Four cylinder, 750 cc. It's heavy. No, 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 daddy. I need a bike. Ooh, and he would not give up. You told me that if I act nicely, you will do it for me. Son, it's not only to ask nice. You also need to ask something that makes sense. <laughs> Daddy, I need a bike. I said, listen, I'm going to get you a bike like that with remote. No, I need to ride on it. My wife looks to me. said, okay, honey. I said, okay, tomorrow I'm going to get you a bike that is so big. It is plastic. It has three wheels and pedals. Can I ride on it, Daddy? Yes, you can ride on it. You bring it tomorrow? Yes. What time? 5 p.m. when I come home. He says, you promise? Yes. And he started, Whoa! he started to scream. I was like, 
having a heart attack. What's wrong with you? Why, why are you screaming? And he stormed through the door, slammed the door, ran in front of the building, called all the kids. Come on, come on, come on. All the kids came. I was watching him through the window of the kitchen. And he says to the kids, I have a bike. It is so big. It has three wheels. It has pedals. It is absolutely wonderful. And I can ride it. And the kids, you do? Yes. Can we see it? It comes tomorrow, 5 o'clock. <laughs> he was already rejoicing. You know, the Bible says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice always, even in your trouble. If God promised, you are secure. My son trusted me, and we don't trust God. That's funny. That's crazy. That's strange. And so, Joshua trusted God. The priest trusted God. People who wait for the problems to be solved in order to obey, they will never experience heaven. You need to know God enough to trust him to do whatever he says without seeing the results. That's when you trust in God. And so, Joshua stepped out in faith, told the priest, they stepped in the water. Then the waters received the waters. Uh, look at what he says. When the priest dipped their feet in the water, then suddenly the tide above and so on and so forth. You know the, you know the paragraph, don't you? And then what happened? God talked to Joshua. Consecrate yourselves so tomorrow the Lord will do great things among you. In, in, in Hebrew it says, consecrate yourselves so tomorrow the Lord could do great things among you. So it was conditional in the grammar in Hebrew. It's a condition. Consecrate yourselves so God could do this and that. What does it mean to consecrate? What does it mean? They had to do four things. Wash themselves. Then go to God in prayer, confess their sins. Because the Bible says, if we confess, God is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse. Go to God in prayer. Go to your neighbor. Don't go back to the temple. Go to your neighbor. Say, I'm sorry. And then the fourth thing, the fourth thing, the fourth thing, circumcise all the men. That's terrible. Because they just crossed Jordan at Gilgal into the enemy land, enemy territory. So now when they cross the border, they could be attacked. And now all men, all army is handicapped oh, in pain. And they had no anesthesia. They had no painkillers. So five, six, seven days, the doctors say, in total pain, totally handicapped. And so now they are an easy prey if the army attacks them, nobody can fight because they are all in pain. Why would God do that? So you know, we humans have a tendency to pray with desperation and after God works to say, did you see how I did it? To do what Satan did, to take God's glory for self. God wants you to know it was him alone. It's what he does, not what you do. God makes you nothing for him to be something. Because if you are something, he can be nothing. And you got to choose, cannot be both. And so they get circumcised. They are on enemy territory. Joshua knows, totally knows that he, right now, at this moment, right now, he is totally exposed the, the, the nation, Israel, could perish, be terminated, be totally uh, uh, eradicated. So Joshua, in desperation, goes to prayer and says, Lord, help me. Lord, I can do nothing. I have power to do nothing. I know nothing. I deserve nothing. Please, we depend on you. Please help us. And as he prays, a soldier attacks him. When it rains, it pours. And Joshua says, are you with us or with our enemies? That's what we do always. We are desperate. We are in crisis. We think that we are alone. We go through this problem or that problem, spiritual or physical or emotional or work problem or health problem, and we think, I've been praying and praying and praying, and God doesn't answer. I am alone. Why doesn't God answer? And we don't realize that God is right there with you in the midst of your prayer, in the midst of your trial. The disciples in the storm on the lake, we perish. And Jesus comes walking on water. And what do they do? They scream, it's a ghost. Hello, if you are Adventist, you know ghosts don't exist. 
Jesus was right there in the midst of their storm. And they confused him with a ghost, with an enemy. Jacob, he's attacked in the night. And he's fighting the stranger who wants to kill him. And he doesn't realize that he's actually fighting God. You think that you are alone fighting. And you don't realize God is right there. Joshua, please help us, help us, help us. God is right there. He says, are you against us? That's what we do. We confuse the one who comes to save us with the one who comes to destroy us. Because we don't know our God. And what he meant to make us, we think it is to destroy us. No, it's not to destroy you, it's to make you. That trial that you go through, you are not alone. And it's not meant to destroy you, it's meant to grow you. And so Joshua says, are you with us or against us? And God doesn't answer. He's, he doesn't say, yes, I am with you, don't worry. Oh, I am against you. He, God doesn't answer. God talks nonsense. He says, take your shoes off. Hello, I'm in war. I am asking you, are you with me or against me? And he says, take your shoes off. What's the connection? In that time, history says that slaves didn't have shoes. Free people had shoes. When you are freed, you are given a certificate of freedom and sandals. When they would go to the temple to worship God, they would take their shoes off when they enter to worship, acknowledging that God is the master and they are the servants. So what was God saying? In the midst of your crisis, spiritual, emotional, job, whatever, health, in the midst of your crisis. So he said, Lord, help me. Help my family. Help my church. Lord, help me. The way to fight the fight is not by focusing on the fight. It is by worshiping God. In the midst of your problem, take your shoes off and understand God is there. And instead of looking to the problem, looking to the walls, looking to the soldiers, looking to Jericho, looking to giants, looking to whoever attacks you, turn your eyes upon Jesus. And fix your eyes on God. That's how you fight your battles. That's what my grandfather used to say. That's how you gain victories. Not by fighting Satan. Not by fighting problems. Not by fighting human nature. By fixing your eyes on the captain of your salvation. Acknowledging him in the midst of your crisis. And right there, worship him. Because worship is not only once a day Sabbath. Worship is every day. Am I right? Worship is every day. Let me explain. I rarely see people changed in the church at worship. But I do see people changed after a car accident or in hospital. You follow me? Worship is every crisis. If in the midst of the crisis, instead of focusing on the crisis, you turn your eyes and focus on God. As you worship him, the more the more you look to the crisis, the more depressed you are, the more discouraged. The more you look to God, the more you understand that he is good. He died for you. He loves you. You are not alone. He is right there in the midst of the crisis. He is with you. He says, even if the mountains move, my love will never move from you. Even if your mother forgets you, I will never forget you. I have inscribed you on my palms. I know you by name. I love you. He is right there. As you worship, you understand that. You understand that he has the power. He has the wisdom. He has the will. And instead of stressing, you start singing. Like my grandpa. Because you see God. Remember the, the, the prophet and the servant on the mountain. Syrian army surrounds the mountain. The prophet, ah, what are we going to do? And the prophet says, Lord, open his eyes. He's looking in the wrong direction. Whoever is with us is greater. You follow me? Than who is against us. We look in the wrong direction, brother and sister. And God says, Turn your eyes from your problems to me. Fix your eyes on me. Worship me. Because as you know me, as you understand me, this is what happens. It says in Isaiah, you keep him in perfect peace. Him whose mind is fixed on you. You follow me? So what happens next? We don't have time. My time is up. The presentation has 51 slides and we did 11. That's okay. 
Are you with us or against us? And he says, take your shoes off. That's what God told Moses. When he saw the burning bush, take your shoes off. That's how you get victory. That's how you start. First thing, you acknowledge that you are never alone. In the midst of your life, in the midst of your crisis, Monday, Tuesday, every day, God is with you and you don't contemplate your problems. You contemplate Jesus. And that's how you grow. That's how you trust. That's how you know him. That's how you rejoice. That's how you realize that you can actually trust him. But number two, what, what does God say? What does God say? Think about it. God says, after he says, take your shoes off, probably Joshua said, Lord, I did, but now what do you want me to do? And God said, well, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take the army and walk around Jericho. And Joshua says, and do you want us to shoot? And God says, no, don't take weapons. Do you want us to be far away from the wall? No, go around the wall. But Jesus, you know what? They can throw arrows like rain. They would kill us all. Should we take shields? No, don't take shields. They can throw fire, rocks. They can kill us. We are exposed. And God says, uh-huh. We can die. Uh-huh. And God says, just walk around the wall. It doesn't make any sense when God talks. It's foolishness for our brain. And then, okay, Lord, second day, you want us to attack? Nah, the battle belongs to me. You don't need to attack your enemy. You need to do what I say. I will fight for you. Second day, walk. What about third day? Walk. What about fifth day? Walk. Oh, I got a drill. Every day I have to walk. Now, don't you assume that if you talk to me one time, you don't need to talk to me. I tell you every day what you need. On the seventh day, I want you to walk seven times. That doesn't make any sense, brother. Does it? Think about Naaman, the guy with leper. God says, go to Jordan, in, in Jordan, seven times. If I was him, I would go one time and look, leper. Second time, oh, leper is smaller. Third time, little, little. Fourth time, no more leper. He looks, leper is there. Second time, third time, fourth time. He says, you know what? Doesn't work. Let's stop doing it. We don't obey God, except if we see. We don't go by trust. We go by seeing the same Joshua. After one day, two days, three days, I would look to the walls. Are there cracks in the walls? Uh, it doesn't work. And then seven day, God says, walk seven times. And then I want the priests to blow the, not the trumpets. He says, tell the priest to take shofar. You know what shofar is? It's horn. It's horn and blow the shofar. They had two types of instruments not to sing. They had many types of instruments to call. They had trumpets that were bronze that anybody could blow to call people for assembly, for war, for wedding, as I did in the army. When I was in the army, in the morning people hated me. At meal, people loved me. Because in the morning, that was, wake up, 5.30. They threw rocks at my window. At noon, that means time to eat. Everybody hugged me. You use the trumpets to call people. But only priests could blow the shofar to call God. The shofar was blown Friday night to call God's presence, blow the Sinai to call God's presence. So God says, have the priest blow the shofar, call God's presence. And then God says, next, shout of victory. Hello? Why would I shout of victory before I get victory? I mean, it's easy to shout of victory after the walls come down. But God wants you to shout of victory before the walls come down. Does it make any sense? You need to know him so much. You need to spend so much time with him. To fix your eyes so much on him. To worship him daily so much. To the degree that you know him enough. To know that you are already victorious in the midst of your crisis. He didn't say, I will give you Jericho. In the Bible he says, I have given 
That's a past tense, done deal. I have given you Jericho. That's a done deal. God says, I read the book. I know the story. I know the end. I tell you, tomorrow you'll still be around and Jericho will be no more. God says, I've given you victory. Stop stressing. I'm giving you salvation. Stop stressing. You should rejoice already. I want them to shout of victory in the midst of their crisis in front of the walls because they have an amazing God. If you fix your eyes on God, you shout of victory. And only when they praise the Lord for victory, before they got victory, the walls came tumbling down. You remember the song? And the walls came tumbling down. You know? <laughs> Folks, our time passed. I was given five minutes about eight minutes ago. And I need to obey because I'm hungry. But let me say this. We will never get victory unless we learn to worship God every second. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, how long? All the time. You will have victory, you will produce fruit. If you separate, you will do nothing. And if you don't have fruits in your life, there is no growth, there is no, in your church, whatever, it means that we separate. Because if we stay in him, keep worshiping, keep your eyes all the time, there is growth, there is victory, there is fruit, there is power. You follow me? There is joy. Let me finish with a paragraph or two. I don't know exactly what number is I'm going to jump. We don't have time to go through the sermon. They are not to conquer in their own power, but in faith. Isn't that powerful? Is not, is not your capabilities. Is not your capabilities. Think about this paragraph. You can read it for yourself. Is not your capabilities that will give you victory. It's only what God does for you. We need to have less confidence in what we can do and more confidence in what he can do. By the way, there is another quotation that says, and I don't know, I don't know if I find it, probably I find it quick. If we plan to our, according to our ideas, we make the plans, the Lord is going to leave us in our mistakes. But if we follow his plan, even if we get to the Red Sea, even if we get to the walls of Jericho, even if we get in the lion's den, even if we get in the prison in Egypt, he will deliver us. Isn't that powerful? If you have given yourself to God to serve, you have no need to be anxious for tomorrow. He whose servant you are knows the end from the beginning. He knows the end from the beginning. Listen, folks. When you take in your hands the management of the things that you have to do and depend on you, you take a burden that God never gave you and try to bear it without him. You take upon yourself the responsibility that belongs to God and this way you put yourself in God's place. But if you believe that God loves you, then you stop worrying. You trust in God as a child trusts in the parent. Isn't that powerful? The victory of tomorrow, the victory of tomorrow depends on your worship of today. You need to keep your eyes on God. Let's stop right here. I got to finish. Yeah, this is it. I found the paragraph. This is it. Never allow yourself to talk in a hopeless, discouraged way. Because whatever you talk influences how you think. In fact, don't even pray doubt. Pray faith. You know what I mean? 
Because whatever flower you water, that's the flower that would grow. Whatever you nurture, feed, emphasize, reinforce, that's what is going to develop. If you reinforce doubt, you are going to grow doubt. If you reinforce faith, talk faith, pray faith, sing faith, don't allow doubt. When Satan puts doubt, say, no, my Jesus is powerful. I know him. I am worshiping him every second. I keep my eyes on him. I can trust in him. If you pray faith, if you talk faith, you grow. By looking at problems, you show evidence of a sick faith. But if you talk as you are invisible, the Lord owns the world. Look heavenly in faith. You, you understand? Keep, your, keep worshiping him every second. Let's finish, folks. Um, our time is up. I want, to, I want to emphasize clearly that he is not... Please, 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 please don't misunderstand me. It's good to go to church, praise the Lord. But it's not that you go to church that is going to save you. It's good to read the Bible. You should. It's God's word. But many people, Pharisees, read the scriptures. Jesus says in John 5, you study the scriptures because you think you get eternal life. But they testify of me. You should go to church, not because it's the right thing to do, but to know God and to worship him. You should study the scriptures not because it's the right thing to do, but to know God, to dig deeper, to worship him. You should pray not because you have needs, but to encounter God, to know him, to spend time with him, to reflect upon him, to keep your eyes on him, to love him. If all you do focuses on him, that's when he gives you victory. So your fight is not to fight. Your fight is to keep worshiping. Your fight is to keep your eyes on God. Your fight is never to separate. You do that, he will, ba will fight your battles. You follow me? In all areas, in spiritual life or in daily life. That doesn't mean that you'll not have troubles, but it means that you are never alone. You are never alone. He says when you go through the... He doesn't say if you will. It's a matter of time. He says when you go through the waters, I will be with you. In the midst of the fire, I will be. In the, in, in the lion's den, I will be with you. You are never alone. Amen? Just keep your eyes. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of the Father in heaven, so many times we talk about you, yet we keep our eyes on other things. And we keep failing and we try hard and we don't know what to do. Help us understand that the power, the battle, the victory belongs to you and you alone. Help us understand that in all areas, it's not only one day a week, every day, we should keep our eyes on you. Never separate. Satan is trying to turn our eyes and our minds from you because he knows you are the source of all power. Help us remain in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.